Recording in progress. All right, we will go ahead and get started here. All right, so we are moving on to transient heat transfer. So the previous, last last night, last night uh, we focused on two-dimensional two steady state uh, heat conduction or heat transfer and only focusing um, on numerical methods. Now we're moving on to transient there we go transient heat transfer Oops. Okay. 
Um, and so we'll focus on two different, two different cases. Number one is if we have no spatial effects. So no spatial effects. And what that means is that something is typically some a material made of very high thermal conductivity um, is suddenly plunged into um, you know some environment at a different temperature and because that thermal conductivity is is uh, so high so something like a metal something like copper or steel or something um, the temperature distribution within the medium is such that anywhere that you look within that that medium the temperature is the same right at any given instant so let me take this out so in other words it's a function of time only the temperature distribution is a function of time only um, for this guy we're going to use something called the lumped capacitance method And so that's what we're going to um, focus on today is just just the lumped capacitance method um, and then tomorrow and the following day we'll start talking about um, um, spatial effects and how we deal with that so with spatial effects and we're only going to be looking at one dimensional transient uh, heat transfer. So in this case, maybe it's a function of X and T, or if you're in cylindrical or spherical coordinates, it would be in terms of R and T. So it's a position, a function of position and time. And there's two ways that we'll, two ways that we'll look at solving this. One is analytically. And for these guys, so this is um, somebody, so we already have analytical solutions. Um, I'll actually pull this up, get our, um, our equation sheet here. Perfect, okay. Um, there we go. So it's on the second page. So you have, you know, if we consider spatial effects, you'll have these kind of ugly theory solutions that somebody has already um, solved for by applying an energy balance, right? Applying the heat diffusion equation, applying boundary conditions, an initial condition, and then integrating and, and, and getting a, a final solution for that temperature distribution. It looks ugly, but um, we'll see. It's not really, not really that bad. Um, so we can plug things into that kind of ugly looking equation. We also have something called Heisler charts. So this would be graphically. And like I said, these are these are Heisler charts. Um, I am not a big fan of the Heisler charts, but some people really like them. They're sort of like um, if you didn't really like the psychrometric charts that you might have used in thermodynamics. Um, because maybe your eyes crossed when you read them, you really won't like these because I think they're a little bit, the lines are even closer together and you also have to deal, some of them you've got an, a logarithmic uh, scale. So that just sort of adds to the difficulty in reading those charts. Um, but again, some people really like them. So tomorrow when we talk about those, I'll use both methods and that way you can decide which one you like better and you can use either one um, on the test. But for now, we're gonna be focusing just on the lumped capacitance method. Um, so we haven't talked about what it is, but before we talk about the equations that are involved in this, let's talk about when we can actually use it. So in other words, when, and we assume 
the temperature is only a, fun a function of time. And the cutoff that we're going to use is that the be it number is less than 0 0.1. And this is on your equation sheet as well. So all these equations kind of like in a little darker gray. This is these are all applicable um, if the be it number is less than 0 0.1. Um, so, so let's go back to our be it number. So our be it number, and it's on your equation sheet. So the definition is H L C over K. All right. L C is not that character. Uh, it's not the corrected length that we talked about when we talked about fins. This is something called the characteristic length. <laughs> That's all kinds of like, <laughs> there we go. Um, and this is equal to the volume over the surface area. So we'll have three different scenarios that we might look at. Um, one is for a plain wall. And we'll be saying, okay, here's our plain wall. And it's of thickness 2L. So if this is x equals 0, this is L, this is negative L. And that kind of makes sense to set it up like that because you'll have convection on either side. Um, and for us, this is we're only going to be looking at symmetrical uh, boundary conditions like this. Um, and so that characteristic length would be just L. So it's the half width of, of a wall. Um, or a cylinder. That LC is equal to R naught divided by 2. That's the V over AS. Um, if you watch the video that's neglecting the surface area at the ends, um, and which because that's unless it's a short cylinder, that area at the ends um, is pretty negligible. And then for a sphere, that LC, which again is volume over the surface area, is R naught over 3. Okay. So when we're deciding When you, when you calculate to see if that be it number is less than 0 0.1, it's recommended to be conservative. And calculate using um, an R naught equal to that LC um, for a cylinder and a sphere. And then when we actually uh, use the equations for the lumped capacitance method, if we if we determine that that's okay, then we'll revert back and we'll use we'll use the we'll use the R naught over two or R naught over three. Um, but you can see that well if I use R naught as opposed to R naught over two or R naught over three, then I really know um, that that be it number is definitely, um, well, not that it's, I guess the way to, to, to say it is that I know that temperature or uh, spatial effects really can be ignored without uh, a huge error involved in my analysis. Um, so let's talk about before we before we go on any further, let's talk about that be it number and what it represents. So I know we've defined it up there, but it's the ratio of the thermal resistances uh, thermal resistance to conduction versus convection. So 
So I'll put here's thermal resistance to conduction over the thermal resistance to convection. And when we talked about when we used Ohm's analogy and we used those thermal resistances, um, they're related to a temperature difference, delta T and a Q. And so we're going to use that definition here. So I have up here, this is a delta T. I'm going to call this delta T conduction because it's different than the delta T for convection. And so I think what I want to do, let's use this guy to kind of think about what we're talking about. So I'll kind of cross out this Q and this Q. So your, del your delta T for conduction, remember that Q is going to cancel out because, you know, if I did a surface energy balance, any Q going in has to be equal to Q going out. So it's, it's the same all the way through. We don't have any energy generation. So that delta T for conduction, this is going to be T um, at X equals L minus t at x equals zero um, and the r for convection or the delta t for convection is going to be t at x equals l minus t um, at t t infinity all right bring this little equal sign down a little bit All right, so that's our be it number. If we could ignore spatial effects, that means the be it number is less than 0.1, then we know that that t that delta t between t x equals l minus t x equals zero. That quantity right there is a good bit different, or a good bit less, I should say, than this difference, t at x equals l minus t infinity. And so if I were to look at the temperature gradient for this plane wall here, okay, so let's say it's originally at some temperature ti. Actually, I think I want to make this a little bit darker. So this is my Ti. And then after a little bit, I or after at after T is equal to zero, right, I switch on something, I all of a sudden expose it to convection. And so what my temperature distribution is going to look like, um, it's going to be well, it'll look kind of like this. And then if I look at outside that is going to be go down a lot more okay go a little bit more well actually it'd be going up wouldn't it uh, oh no that's fine that's fine so that's at some t i don't know t1 here it is at t2 right eventually it's, you know, once it goes to steady state, it's going to be at some T infinity, right? But in the interim, if I look at, let me kind of highlight it. So delta T out here and here versus the delta T within here. You can see that it's not that there's not a huge gradient within the medium. So you can see why saying, well, that be it number, if the be it number is low, then, well, the temperature is going to be pretty much uniform um, at whatever time point that we're looking at uh, within the medium. So, okay. Well, let's see. I think, Sorry. yeah. Could you say that last point again? I think I was a little confused as to like which um you were referring to when you were comparing the two of them and how they didn't look that different <laughs> okay hopefully it's it's not a i think this one might just be my poor 
Let me make this a little bit better. How's that? So I'm trying to show I that. that yeah, 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 yeah. It's just because my my poor. I'm I'm not an artist, but yeah. So, but the the temperature vari variation within the medium is not as much as the temperature variation within uh, the fluid on the side. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I guess that's it. If there's anything I wanted to say. I don't think so. Nope. I think we're good. Let's keep going. All right. So we have, so we have the temperature of a gas stream is to be measured by a thermal couple whose junction can be approximated as a 1.25 diameter sphere. So I'm going to draw my sphere here. So here's the sphere. It's terrible. Close enough. Diameter of this guy, 0 0.012 meters. Oh, I'm sorry. I need another zero there, don't I? 0 0.0012 meters. Uh, and then we're given some properties. So I've got a K is 35. I'm going to put this in terms of not watts per meter degree Celsius, but watts per meter Kelvin, just because I'm used to writing it like that. And then rho, my density, 8,500 kilograms per meter cubed. And then we've got a CP, and that's 2,0 joules per kilogram and I'll also put this in Kelvin as opposed to degrees Celsius. Again, it's the same value. You don't need to do any sort of unit conversion or anything like that. Um, I will say like a little word of caution. Sometimes those units are given, so sometimes the, the units or CP, um, are in terms of they'll be given in terms of kilojoules per kilogram K um, and you'll definitely want to change it to joules per kilogram K to make sure that things work out so just just watch your units that's all um, another thing for solids and liquids Sometimes you'll see that subscript dropped. Um, so CP, CV, they're all the same thing. So it, it will be different for a gas, but it won't, it'll, uh, when you're talking about solids and liquids, it's just the same thing. So just be aware of that. Some textbooks will, will drop it. Okay. Um, then we've got a, I don't know what the temperature is. I don't know what this temperature out here is. I don't even know if it's higher or lower, but I will put a little, here's the temperature and then my H value is 65 watts per meter squared. I'll put this as Kelvin and I don't know what the initial temperature is. And here's what I'm gonna do. I am going to, and I actually, I did up, update the PDF online, um, but the wording of this is, I don't want to say problematic, but I think it can be interpreted two different ways. I know what the problem statement meant, but I also see you could interpret it two ways. So I'm going to rephrase it. So how long will it take? All right, so let's see what I said. How long will it take for the temperature difference? I'm going to cross out everything thermal couple on, okay? So for the temperature difference uh, and it, I'm talking about between uh, the, the, um, the sphere and T infinity. How long will it take that temperature difference to be 1% different. The 
temperature difference. <laughs> Between the initial temperature and T environment. I don't know. Maybe I didn't really make it better now that I'm writing it out. But so what I'm looking for, I am looking for what is the time want to find the time when I looked at, okay, oops, the diff, the difference between, okay, the, the temperature within the medium, and this is sort of going to, I'm, I'm sort of jumping the gun and assuming that, um, this thing is, um, I can ignore spatial effects, but we'll, we'll check that shortly. Minus, minus our T infinity oops, over T initial minus T infinity. is equal to 0 0.01. So this is theta over theta initial. So theta is just, um, it's theta over theta initial. So these are non-dimensionalized temperatures. So theta over theta initial. Um, and the reason that we introduced them is because really it just made the math easier when deriving those lumped capacitance equations. So, um, sure. Don't know if I had already. Check. Okay, I did fix it. It's it's right on your your packet. Mine's a little bit different. Uh, oh, perfect. We have them right here too. All right, so this is the equation I'm going to be using. I guess I've got lumped capacitance methods two places on that on your heat transfer packet. Um, okay. So the first thing that I do need to do is figure out whether my whether my assumption that I'm just plowing ahead with um, is figure out well is it okay to make the assumption that uh, there are no spa spatial effects? So I'm going to check it right here. So the B at number, and we'll check it based on. Remember, we're going to be conservative, and we're going to calculate just on the radius. So this is going to be H R naught over K. So let's see. 5 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And then I have a R naught. So gosh, 0 0.0006 meters. And then our K value, 35. 35 watts per meter Kelvin. So we have that our B at number hmm, 0.011. So yes, although I didn't say what question I'm answering, the question I'm answering is that it's only a function of tip time, not position. Perfect. All right. So our lumped capacitance method is, is valid. All right. So I'm going to look on my equation sheet. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, so the question was, how come we used R0 as opposed to R0 over, uh, over 3? Um, and this is because we're being conservative. So when you calculate conservative... When you calculate that B at number to see if the lumped capacitance method is valid, um, we're, did I write it somewhere? Yeah. So when you calculate to see if the B at number is 
less than 0.1, be conservative and calculate using R0 is equal to LC. And then later on, when we actually use it, then we'll go back, okay, characteristic length is R0 over 3. Okay. I will say that I don't think any of the problems that we're doing will make the, a difference. Um, but in practice, it's probably a good, it's a good habit to get into. All right. So I'm going to pull right off my equation sheet. Uh, this guy right here. All right. So let's do that. And I'll write it just like they've got there, pretty much just like what we've got there. So we have theta over theta initial. This is equal to 0 0.01. Um, and it's equal to uh, e to the negative h. And we've got the surface area. And we've got the time. That's the time that we're looking for over um, uh, the uh, row times the volume, uh, uh, row times the volume times, oh, CP. That's right, CP. All right, so that's, I'm just pulling it straight off of my equation sheet there. All right, I can simplify this just a little bit because remember our characteristic length, which we know now, now we're going to use R naught over three now that we're actually plugging stuff in. And that's equal to volume over the surface area. Um, and so that's what I'm going to use down below here. So this is going to be negative H T over rho and then times the characteristic length times CP. So we'll plug some numbers. Actually, we'll not plug any numbers in yet. Um, let's take the natural log of both sides and then we'll figure out what our T is. So if I, because I want to get rid of that E to the whatever, right? So I have the natural log of 0 0.01. Um, I'll have a negative out here because the, then the other side is going to be HT over rho LCP. Uh, rho LCP. Um, so now this is going to become, that's a negative. And then I've got rho, which is uh, 8,500. Kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, LC, remember, is R naught. Uh, so 0 0.00, uh, is it a third zero? <laughs> it was six meters time. Are you extending this equation from the, the E raised to the negative HT? Uh, well, you're going to have to take the natural log of both sides to get rid of that E. We're solving oh. for T, right? Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so that's rho times LC times our CP and our CP 320. So 320, and this is joules per kilogram K. Perfect. And then I need to divide by H. And our H was the 65 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Um, and I don't want to forget, remember the that LC was R naught over 3. So there should be, uh, actually, wait a minute. There should be a three right there, right? Because this guy is R naught over three. And I think we've got everything. And now this would be equal to T. Let's see what that ends up being. All right, so I end up getting 39 seconds. Right. Let's do another one. Where did the R not go? Oh, it's this guy. 
in our life. All right, so problem seven. Hopefully similar in that we can st we can use this uh, lumped capacitance thing. So we have steel balls 12 millimeters in diameter. Perfect. Start drawing stuff. Can you go up for just a quick second? I didn't get the T equals Sure. Three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So we have, yeah, so 12 millimeters in diameter, and they're annealed by heating to 1150 Kelvin and then slowly cooling to 400 Kelvin in an air environment in which the temperature is 325 Kelvin. So let me, if I need to go back at the end or whatever, you just yell at me, or if I, you know, I, I don't mind going back. Um, so they've heated it up. Oh, and I'll write the diameter of this guy. So 12 millimeters. So 0 0.012 meters. Uh -huh -huh. Yep. Um, so it is initially at a temperature, T initial, 1150 Kelvin. And then it's cooled to 400 Kelvin. So at some time, and I do need to find that time, so at some time T, it's cooled to 400 Kelvin. Um, and then the, the air, the convection, convective environment is 325 Kelvin. And then we've got a convection coefficient of 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Um, assuming the properties of that steel, okay. So I'll go ahead and write it down. It's in the problem statement. I guess you don't really have to write it, but I, I like it just all in the same place. So density 7,800 kilograms per meter cubed. And here we're writing the specific heat C, uh, 600 joules per kilogram K. So you see it's, it doesn't matter whether we write C or CP, it's the exact same thing. And we want to find, well, what is T? How much time did that take? Right. So again, I would start figure out what is that B at number? So our B at number is HLC over K. And we're going to use that LC equals R naught to see if our Viet number is less than 0 0.1. All right, so we'll plug in those numbers and see. So I have 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And then we have our R naught, at least not so many zeros, 0 0.0006 meters uh, divided by our K, which is 40. And we should get a B at number 0 0.003. So you could see, you know, even if I had used, uh, yeah, so it's, yeah. Both, both being conservative with an LC of R naught and if I wasn't conservative, LC is equal to R naught over three, it would still give me a B at number less than less than 0.1. So, so because that B at number is less than 0 0.1, then the temperature is a function of time only. And that means that we can use those lumped capacitance equations. No surprise, but today that's 
all we're going to be doing. So that Viet number is always going to be less than, than 0.1. Um, but it's not always going to be the case. It's always when you have these problems, the first thing that you should do when you've got a transient problem, check and see if that be at number is less than 0.1, because if it is, the math is a lot easier. It'll be, it'll be a much simpler problem. All right. So what are we trying to find? We're fi trying to find T. Okay. So I'm going to use that exact same equation and let's see what we've got. So the equation from my heat transfer packet. So it's theta over theta initial, which is T at uh, whatever R, uh, uh, not whatever R, whatever T, I'm sorry, whatever time minus our T infinity over T initial minus T infinity equals E to the negative um, H times T uh, times that surface area over the volume uh, times rho times CP or C. We'll just write it as C. Okay. And then I know that volume over the surface area this is characteristic length, and this will, for a sphere, it's going to boil down to R0 over 3. All right. So let's rearrange it because I'm trying to find T. Let's at least get that. So, um, yeah, so this is going to be, I'm going to have to take the natural log of both sides. So T, function of time. Minus our T infinity or T initial minus T, oops, sorry, T infinity. Uh, then we'll have a negative sign over here. And so V over the surface area is our LC. So I'm going to be multiplying by R naught over three um, and then I'll have a uh, row times CP up here uh, and then a then a H so I think I think we've got everything that we need here and that's going to be equal to T I think I've got everything okay so negative natural log of Plug in those numbers, so I've got 400 Kelvin minus our 325 over the initial temperature, 1150 Kelvin minus 325 times R naught, 0 0.006 meters times our row 7800 kilograms per meter cubed uh oh there's a cp over there so 600 all right i have a feeling my head's messing up joules per kilogram k and then all of that is going to be over three times that 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Okay. And all of that's going to be there. So hopefully, hopefully what we end up getting, uh, 11.22 seconds. So super ugly equation, but there you go. So these are super easy. You know, if you can use the lumped capacitance, they're really easy. I mean, there's a lot of terms, but they're pretty easy equations to use. Okay. So problem eight, 
problem eight, we've got a heat transfer coefficient for air flowing over a sphere is to be determined. So for the next problem, we don't know what H is. So that, and that's gonna be something that we're gonna need to find. So we're gonna need to find H. Okay, and we have another sphere, good times. So here's our sphere. Um, so it's to be determined by observing the temperature time history of a sphere fabricated from pure copper. Um, and if you look at the problem statement, you'll notice that there are some properties that are missing that they didn't give you. Um, so we'll, we'll actually kind of, I want to show you where you could get those and then I'll just give them to you. Yeah. Um, so the diameter of this guy, 0 0.0, um, 0.012, uh, actually, I'm sorry, too many zeros. 127 meters. Um, it is 66 degrees before it's inserted into an airstream. So the initial temperature is 66 degrees. And then we've then after T is equal to zero, any time after T is equal to zero, um, it's inserted into an airstream that's at 27 degrees Celsius. Uh, we don't know what H is. That's what we're supposed to find. Um, a thermal couple on the outer surface of the sphere indicates that indicates 55 degrees Celsius, 69 seconds after the sphere is put into that airstream. So what they give us is that the temperature at 69 seconds is equal to 55 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, Okay, so we want to find H, uh, and they're telling us, so it says, assume and then justify that the sphere behaves as a space-wise isothermal object. All that means is just that it's the, right, isothermal, it's the same temperature all the way through the medium. Now, the temperature is clearly changing over time, but at any time point you take a picture of it or you know take a snapshot of that thermal profile it's the same throughout the the temperature is the same throughout the entire medium so we are going to assume um, that temperature is a function of time only and then after we do it we'll justify that assumption So it's a little bit of a kind of a cyclical knowledge or cyclical uh, uh, justification or, or reasoning there, because you know normally when we when we figure out can we ignore spatial effects, we calculate that Biot number. The Biot number is dependent on H. So we say, okay, well let's assume that temperature is only a function of time. We calculate an H, then we use that H. To plug into the be it number to see if that be it number is less than 0.1 so it's not perfect um, but it's all we can do if we ended up calculating a be it number that um, was kind of close to 0.1 or a little over the over 0.1 then we would probably need to take a step back um, and calculate things based on um, not ignoring those those spatial effects but for the time being, we're going to ignore them. So I guess I'll I'll throw that on here. Here's my assumption. They only a function of time. All right. So want to find H. So I'm going to use that same equation, right? Theta over theta initial is equal to E to the negative um, H. Um, and I've, I've written it a couple of times, so I'm just going to kind of put that volume over surface area. 
the the volume over surface area it's just lc so it's going to be lc on the bottom and well our lc is um r not over three so actually i will just put it like this so i've got row lc is that l not over three and i've got c okay there we go. All right. And I'm trying to find H. Perfect. So my H is going to be the natural log of this non-dimensionalized temperature. Um, I'm going to have a negative over here, right? Because there was a, there's a negative right there. Okay, <laughs> I'm like, all of a sudden, uh, what am I doing? Uh, so this was going to be R naught. Oh, and I realized something. I'm so stupid. I'm sorry. Y'all are probably like, why are you confusing us? So it's not L naught. It's R naught. Because that's the characteristic length. Okay. All right. So this is going to be rho times r naught times c, and then all of this is going to be over 3 times t. Good gracious. So if I plug that in, good gracious, awful, just terrible. So this is going to be negative, and then it's going to be 55 degrees. Go away. 55 degrees. Celsius minus our T infinity, 27 degrees Celsius over T initial, 66 degrees Celsius minus 27 degrees Celsius. Okay, so natural log, oops, natural log of that jazz right there times, oh yeah, and we do need to get some properties, don't we? So yeah, I probably need to get that. We need row we're going to need c and we're also going to need k so you can get all of these i believe for copper it's in table a1 um, i might suggest getting it at the average temperature between uh, 55 and, and 66 degrees because that's the average temperature of the medium um, so yeah, 66 plus 55 divided by two degrees Celsius. I'm sorry. What does that say in the first part of the equation? The E raised to the, <laughs> is that a five? Kind of looks like it doesn't. It's, it's R naught. E. R naught. How's that? That's better. And that's over three? Yes. Yes. There we go. All right. So let's go to A1 and see what we've got and just at least show you that you can get these values here. So if I do go to A1. And on scrolling. Yeah. So you do have values for copper. So you can get your K, your CP, your density. Um, so they don't have density as a function of of uh, temperature, but I mean, you're talking about a solid. It's not going to change appreciably, right? It's incompressible. Um, and then you can get that K and CP at, um, at a, a, an average temperature. I'm just going to give you the value and most likely on a test, I'm just going to give you the value, but I wanted to at least show you that you can look those up. Uh, so I've got eight, eight, nine, three, three. 
guy is kilograms per meters cubed. I've got a CP of 389. The units are joules per kilogram K. And then a K value of 398. So watts per meter Kelvin. All right. So hopefully I did my algebra right down here. 8933 kilograms per meter cubed times our R naught, which was 0 0.0127 meters divided by two, right? The diameter divided by two times our CP 389. Joules per kilogram K. And then I've got three over uh, over three times 69 seconds. Okay. So I think that's it. All right. So hopefully what we end up getting. So 35.3 watts per meter squared Kelvin. All right, so that would be for A. And then for B, you're just seeing if that was a good assumption to make. So calculate that B at number, be conservative. So we're gonna use um, an R naught for that characteristic length when checking the B at number. Checking if that B at number is less than 0.1. So this is HLC over K. So our calculated H is 35.3 watts per meter squared Kelvin times our LC, uh, which we were just using R naught. So the diameter 0 0.0127 meters divided by two. So that's, yeah, sorry, that's a, let me make that a little bit. A little bit better. <laughs> zero point zero again twelve zero point uh, zero one two seven meters. There we go. Divided by our K. Uh, K being 398. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Watts per meter Kelvin. All right, so I end up getting a B at number of, well, I know it's less than 0 0.1, but I don't actually have it. Probably can figure this out, so 35 points. Uh, so, oh, really, really small number. 0 0.0005. Yeah. So, yes. It was a valid assumption. It was a valid assumption. We have justified it. All right. All righty. All right, how's everybody feeling about this this type of material? It's not too bad. It's pretty much it's plug and chug. Um, yeah, make sure you understand why uh, you know why these equations are valid, the reasoning why. But yeah, not too bad. All right. So we have a thermal energy storage unit consists of a large rectangular channel which is well insulated on its outer surface and encloses alternating layers of the storage material and the flow passage. Each layer of the storage material is an aluminum slab um, of width 0 0.05. So I'm gonna zoom in on the picture here so we can kind of figure what's going on here. 
So the white spaces look like it's that's where the channel is. That's where the hot gases are flowing through. And then if I wanted to like look at the, just the slab, each of those slabs, zero point zero five meters. Um, and then we've got hot gases. Like I do know this temperature. So hot gases at 600 degrees Celsius. We've got a thermal or a uh, convective heat transfer coefficient of 100 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Um, I do have some properties. So we've got, and I don't think they give it to you, um, but for steel, and maybe before I put that, I will say that it does say that all of these guys, these are these are at an initial temperature, uniform temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. All right, so I might, you know, if you had to look it up, you might look at the average temperature of maybe 25 and 600, um, maybe a little bit closer to 25 because what we're going to be calculating is how long will this take, will it take to achieve 75% of the maximum possible energy storage. So they talk about, they talk about, they say consider conditions for which the storage unit is charged. So charge just means that we're heating it up, we're storing thermal energy and we, and the maximum amount of thermal energy would be if we let this thing go long enough so that those those slabs are would be at, in thermal equilibrium with the hot gases at 600 degrees. We're, we're looking at a little bit earlier than that because we're looking, okay, well, 75% of the maximum amount of heat that you can store or the maximum amount of thermal energy that you can store. Um, so yeah, maybe a little bit closer to not the average, maybe a little lower than the average, but I'm going to give you these values for steel. Rho is not going to change, but Rho is 2702, and this is kilograms per meter cubed. We have a thermal conductivity of 231. So 231 watts per meter Kelvin. And then we have a specific heat of 1033 joules per kilogram K. So again, just watch your units with the, with the specific heat. Um, sometimes it's in kilojoules per kilogram K. And so you just need to make sure that you watch your units. Hint, hint, if you, if you yeah, if you get a problem like this on a test. Yeah. Um, would also want to say I don't guess I want to say anything else this is this is fine um, so so I want to find I want to find how long will it take so I want to find um, a little bit fatter I want to find the time when Q, Q over Q, like where the tail is going, Q max is equal to 0 0.75. So we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. So let's check our B at number. And actually, you know what? I need to kind of get my bearings about, well, what's the thing that I'm talking about? Because we have this whole like um, thermal energy storage unit. So before I, I'll actually just put all my work in the solution portion, not the assumption to keep it kind of neat. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at a single slab. Because if I, if I look at that, if I figure out, well, for a single slab, 
when you know what time is q over q max for that single slab is is 0.75 well it's that's the way it is for the entire thing so i'm going to look at a single slab so here's my slab let's look at our dimensions here all right so remember on either side you've got convection Here we go. So on either side, you've got convection. Here's the midline, sort of. <laughs> so this is x equals zero. This is the half width, which remember you you remember the this guy right here. 0 0.05. Well, the half width would be 0 0.025. So that's what I'm going to put. So this is. 0.025 meters. Perfect. And then this would be negative L. Okay. So I'm going to calculate the B at number to see if the B at number is less than 0 0.1. Perfect. So there's no like special rule for a plain wall to remember, okay, use use this characteristic link when you're calculating the B at number to see if you can use the lumped capacitance and then no, it's just it's just L. So this is gonna be H L C over K. So let's plug some numbers in here. So I have one hundred watts per meter squared Kelvin. times that char characteristic length 0 0.025 meters over K. So our K is 231 and that's watts per meter Kelvin. So I end up getting a B at number 0 0.011. Perfect. So I can say that T is a function of time only. Maybe I throw that in my in my assumptions. There we go. Perfect. All right. So if we look on the equation sheet, let's go look. You'll notice that you do have an equation for Q. So it's this guy right here. Go away. <laughs> so you have Q, but you don't have Q max. Um, so let's at least write down Q. So from our equation sheet. We have... <laughs> It would be much more fun if we let the dog host. <laughs> so I have rho times the volume. Rho times the volume times CP times this theta um, initial. And then we've got a 1 minus E to the negative H T over uh, that characteristic length, because remember it's volume over surface area. Um, and if we look at this, look at our equation here, we have we have volume over surface area. So I'm just putting that as LC instead. Characteristic length. So this is our characteristic length um, times uh, rho times our CP or C. Okay. So there are three terms down here. I realize they're sort of make this uh All right, that's a term. That's a term. And the LC is a term. Yeah. Okay. And then I guess that's it. Perfect. Alright, so I know what to do with that equation. I might not know what to do with the with the Q max, but 
that's okay. So remember this, this theta i? This is just the difference between the initial temperature and t infinity. So it's t initial minus t infinity, right? So if I think about Q max, I'm going to think back to thermo. Okay. So think thermo. So if I applied, um, yeah, if I applied my first law to that slab, looks like this. Okay, well, clearly I don't have any of that. I don't have any work. I've just got Q is equal to delta U. Um, and then maybe I want to put that in terms of mass times delta little U, right? Internal energy on a per mass basis. Um, and then I remember if I've got an incompressible substance, such as a solid slab, And we could say that delta U is equal to C delta T. So you could sort of see where we're going here. So now this becomes M C delta T. And I could even make it better by saying, well, that mass, I could actually put this as rho times the volume because that's the mass, right? Density times volume is just going to give you mass. And then I've got C delta T. Oh man, whoopsies, looking pretty good. If I kind of look at this, Ooh, look at that, look at that. Um, and what we'll see is that Q max is actually rho V C theta initial because the maximum heat would be uh, that would be transferred into that slab would be if the slab came into thermal equilibrium with the with the environment. If it went from 25 degrees Celsius, where is it? Right. If it went from 25 degrees Celsius um, and then it came into thermal equilibrium with the environment. So well, now that's that Q over that Q, Q, can't make my Q look right. My Q over Q max. So could we have just um, assumed that T was at like time infinity? Because that would have made the E term in the above Q go away, right? And it would have just been the same Q max. Uh. Okay, so, so say it again. I want to make sure. So the um, the time term in the uh, exponential up at the top where you just have Q. Ah, uh, uh, this guy? If that had gone to infinity, it would have put T to zero, and we would have had the same Q max at the bottom. Absolutely. Yes, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, absolutely. See, it takes a village. If T goes to infinity, then now your your Q max, that would be your Q max, and now your Q max is, you get the same thing. Rho V C times theta initial. Love it. All right. So if we put, if we put Q over Q max, now that Rho V C specific heat times theta initial, now, oh gosh, now it just becomes one minus E to the negative uh, H T over L C rho C. Um, so I will assume that you can probably plug that stuff in. Let's see what it would be nice if I got a number. Oh, I'm not calculating Q over Q max. I'm solving for T. Darn it. So. All right, so I'd have, I gotta have, so it'll be one minus 
if this guy is 0 0.75, I'm going to have 1 minus 0.75, so 0 0.25. Um, yep, and then I've got to take the natural log of that, and then I've got to, I'm going to have to multiply that by rho LC times the specific heat uh, divided by negative H, and that should get me time. All right, Just had to bring it home. <laughs> so I've got 968 seconds. Perfect, so that's A. Um, and I think there was another part of it. Yeah, there was another part of it. So B, and I didn't write this in my find, but I'll write it here. So we want to find, well, what is the temperature at this time? So when T is equal to 968 seconds. Easy peasy. All right, and so I'm going to go back to, to my other equation, right? So I've got T at... 968 seconds. It's the theta over theta initial one. So this is minus T infinity. Over T initial minus T infinity. And then this is equal to E to the negative H times T, which now we know I'm going to just plug it in 968 seconds. Um, over rho L C times specific heat. There we go. And just solve for that temperature. So T at 968 seconds. End up getting 456 degrees Celsius. There we go. So you'll notice that I haven't really converted any of my temperatures into Kelvin, and it's really not necessary because you're dealing with temperature differences, um, and the temperature difference in degrees Celsius or Kelvin is exactly the same, so you don't need to worry about that. If you do find yourself like raising a temperature to a power or multiplying by it or something like that, yeah, you want to put it in Kelvin, but here it doesn't really matter. All right, so... I think we have reached the point where we're on to next time. <laughs> so we actually finished up a little bit early in class today as well. So, But next time we'll talk about transient. Can we see the dog? The dog is gone. She usually like, she, she usually is by my side if I'm in the house, but she does not like my office because I've got, the computer and a couple of monitors and it's it's hot <laughs> she doesn't want to be hot <laughs> oh no her name is leela I, I messed up because i named her leela and my daughter is lily so you can see that i always mix up those names luckily my daughter has a good sense of humor but yeah all right but anyway all right so next time we'll talk about transient heat transfer with spa spatial effects. And I'll pull out those awful Heisler charts. I don't like them. I hated them. <laughs> I hated them as an undergraduate and I don't like them now either. So, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll work them. We'll, we'll show how we can use them anyway. Maybe you'll, maybe you will like them. All right. Do I need to go back? Anybody need to see anything that we missed? All right, thank you. I'll the same thing. Put the timer on. I'll hang out. If you think of any questions, just pipe on up, okay? All right, thank, thank you.